He's worked for uh, several global senior leadership teams from SMB to Fortune 500 corporations to help bring the art of possible to life with strategic thinking, analytics, insights, and operational excellence. His servant leadership approach has been a successful legacy of building, mentoring, and enabling teams to embrace data-driven strategies innovate to build digital marketing solutions to optimize performance to meet or exceed the business objective. And this guy is so connected. This is what you want uh, with, with uh, working with a, a, a fellow like Trinidad. So we're very for uh, fortunate to have you here and, and pleased to have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, Trinidad McGeary. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rick, for the warm introduction. And you weren't supposed to tell the brick story. I'm yeah, 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 the brick, yeah. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> I know, right? But buenos dias, welcome. I am so excited and honored to be up here in St. Paul. Um, it's been a minute since I've been to the great north, um, and I'm very pleasant to be pleased with your weather, because us Texans always talk about weather. Is it raining? Is it too hot? Is it droughting? Whatever. So we're always talking about the weather. But uh, fantastic. So thank you again. And I'm really here to talk about you know, the power of advertising, yes, we're gonna take it up a notch because we heard some great speakers talking about digital marketing, print marketing. It's really about the 360 approach. There's no silver bullet. And I think as a marketer, you have to really truly understand that from a marketing strategy, a marketing strategic standpoint. I go, you're gonna hear me say this quite often. It's always about the business objective. It's always about what is it you're trying to achieve? Because if you're talking about you know, exposing your brand, then it's about, you know, you, you have to build your marketing strategy to meet that business objective. Because I want brand awareness as my business objective. If I'm trying to drive goals to my parking lot, uh, to my car's lot, or, you know, sell more homes, do whatever, then you're going to probably shift gears and say, I need a different type of marketing strategy to meet that business objective. So whatever that is, that's what we're going to reinforce today. And I love data. I am a data geek. Um, you know, so that's where I really look at that art of the possible. Say, okay, where do you want to go? Where do you want to be? I ask the hard questions. I don't let you take a pass. I want more money. I want more exposure. No, it's like, what is that? We're going to talk about that. We're going to measure that. And when you talk about data, you know, one of the things when you really start to dive into the data, besides that top level number, a lot of the fortune companies that I've seen in those boardrooms are like, oh, we're doing fantastic. Are you? Well, let's look at this little outlier that we're seeing in the data. And that's often the underserved, under-targeted Hispanic market. It. Now, I'm an independent marketing consultant and have the Hispanic CMO, but my favorite tagline is still about culture, not language. You've heard about that. Because when we talk about that, that's going to be more prevalent within this conversation. And please, this is a conversation, so I know you guys aren't shy. Ask me questions. And this is going to be more of a journey than me just spitting a lot of data and facts to you. So I look forward to this. So when we talk about in 2021, U.S. ad market, when we're talking about spending, just last year alone, we spent about $284 billion in advertising spend as a nation. And now most of that was geared toward targeting what we call the general population. Now, what's interesting about this number is what I always call vanity metrics, right? Again, depending on what your business objective is, is the vanity metrics are about your impressions, reach, and frequency. Are they really aligned with your business objective? Often not, 66% of the CMOs today cannot necessarily um, successfully attribute did their marketing campaigns meet the said business objective. That's by Forbes. That's kind of shocking. So that means 33% are actually looking at the data. They may not be measuring the data correctly, but they're at least looking at it. But 66, the overwhelming majority, and we're talking you know, your big business, your corporate America here, not necessarily doing a good job. It's a need. That correlates with 75% of the CEOs as marketers, we're always asking for more money, and they're saying, you know what, I can't really explain the type of impact that incremental ad spend is gonna have toward my business objective. So if 66% of the CMOs can't say, I, can't, I have great data attribution that this campaign generated X, Y, Z, whatever the business objective is, well, it's likely to say, yeah, 75% can't speak in plain speak to say, yeah, your ad campaign absolutely tanked or bombed or I don't understand. So clear communication gaps, and that's extremely frustrating for marketing because there's enormous pressure on us to deliver results. Does that sound familiar? We've got to improve your results. We've got to lower the CAC, you know, the ROI. 
you know, got to increase the spin to get, you know, do less with more. And oh, by the way, by the way, we have to keep up with the fast paced changes in consumer behavior. Now we're not talking about, you know, we're talking big picture, you know, from the rising or millennials, which are now here, we're all talking about, but the, really the emergence of the Gen Z. How are they consuming, you know, their media? What does that landscape look like? We have boomers down, we have Gen Xers. Yeah, I'm a Gen Xer, don't forget about me. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, millennials and Gen Z are starting to be, you know, top of mind as marketers are starting to address the general population and how their tactics go. So, you know, we're at a, we're kind of at a crossroad here. You know, when you talk about data-driven marketing strategy, can we agree that we should have this? It's pretty critical, because if you don't understand how your data, how your marketing is performing, it really could dry up or you really could see a great return. So, uh, holistically, I think we all can agree that data is absolutely important, or at least we should be capturing and measuring and seeing what that ROI is and how we're performing as is aligns to the business objective. Now, I'm going to make a bold statement. This is sta something I really don't say much, but if we can agree on this premise that data is king, then the rest of the presentation will make a heck of a lot more sense. Because what I'm going to propose is, you know, audacious. Brands that ignore the Hispanic market really will not survive. Now, that's a bold statement. Why? You've heard these statements before. I've tried Hispanic marketing. It doesn't work. My ROI isn't there. Uh, there's no really any budget. It's a niche market. These are common things that we've seen as we've come up over the decade. Well, here's why, especially for brands that are looking to future-proof themselves, why they should pay attention. Doesn't matter what industry, doesn't really matter what products are good or person you're trying to sell. Here's what we're gonna go. Now we're gonna go some numbers that we already know. We already know that Hispanics make up 20% of the US population nationally. But to what Isaac has said, and there's no reason, and this correlates with exactly what he says just on home ownership, is you see that the population boom is ex, you know, ex, ex absolutely accelerating. In fact, in Dallas, Texas, it's been the primary population driver has been in Hispanic uh, births than general market. So Hispanic, you know, and then there's you know, very similar number to what he says, 62 million folks, US born, versus when you talk about uh, your foreign born. So you could see that 62, 20, you know, percent, you know uh, in terms of millions, most of them are here in America. When you talk about that, interesting news is in the 2020 census, you know, the Hispanic population is actually undercounted by a margin of 5% or three times more margin of error than in 2010. Now, what does that mean for business? That means roughly around 3 million cons Hispanic consumers were undercounted, okay? And how does that impact? Well, you know, when, when we look at the demographic at, uh, impact, it's, okay, the Mexican consumer, or excuse me, Mexican population, bulk of it is Mexican, 59.7% followed by Puerto Rican, Cuban, El Salvadorian, and whatnot. But what's interesting to me is that 64% of the demographic considers themselves, I'm American, and I'm Hispanic. But what's also more interesting to me is that 11% don't even consider themselves Hispanic. That means that, hey, I don't speak Spanish. You know, I'm more American than I am, you know, uh, Hispanic, so I don't really consider or fall myself in this bucket. And when you talk about states, well, where do they live? It's no so shocking, California, Texas, Florida, New Mexico. But what's interesting is that eight additional states have reached the million uh, population threshold. That's up from uh, when the last report was taken. I think it's a margin of three more states were added. So we're seeing it across the nation. We're seeing the population growth. And I'm going to pick on Texas is that why was that census uh, number I just called that out? Well, as of last year, 39.2% of Hispanic Texans represented the Texas population, which wielded, oh, by the way, over 160 billion in purchasing power alone. Just in Texas. Just in Texas. In Minnesota, it's 6% Hispanic, uh, roughly. When you talk about non-Hispanic whites, they make up 39.8. Now, those are percentages. That delta is about two to 300,000 folks. That's the margin of difference. When you look at that census now, and if you start to add those numbers back in, one can make the case that Hispanic population in Texas is now the new majority. I mean, just by, you know, that, that's my hypothesis. So by not investing in a Hispanic uh, strategy today, 
business could miss a major opportunity, you know, not by not marketing the soon-to-be Hispanic majority. We're tracking? So when we talk about this Hispanic audience, <coughs> holy guacamole, we're young. I mean, 61% of the population are under the age of 35. When you talk about millennials, Gen Zers, we just talked about that. 23% make up the millennial population and 27% make up the Gen Z population. And this is my favorite number. Every 30 seconds, we get a new consumer because they just turned 18. Every 30 second, Hispanic turns 18. That's amazing to me. And you know, by the time we're talking, you're talking about whether they're in politics, that's a new voter. If you're talking about a new consumer, that's someone that can be eligible to get a new job and start contributing to the local and national economy. I mean, every 30 seconds, this is the rising impact, and this is why they've been dubbed the super consumer. In addition to that, we're going to play a fun game. I know everybody just got out of school, and I know everybody understands these other terms. We've got mean, median, and mode. If you don't remember, I'm going to help you out here. <laughs> no worry. Mode means really the most common. So basically, if you had 10 balls, you had four red balls and three blue and three green. Okay, really? Okay, the mode is four, because that's the most red balls in that data population set, okay? So when we talk about that, we're gonna correlate that to consumer years, and we're gonna concern, uh, continue that to lifetime value. Because in consumer years, we can say retirement's the age of 65, if we all can agree on that. And an interesting stat is, about roughly throughout your consumer year lifetime, you're spending about $63,000 per year, okay? So if we all can agree holistically that these are the numbers, then here comes the game. So when we talk about non-Hispanic whites, what do you think that data set, the most populous age group is in America? Do we say boomers? boomers. Okay, can you give me a number? Like 60, 65? 58. 58? Okay, good job. Now we name Hispanic, right? Hispanic youth, do we want to guess? 38? Oh, man, you're rocking. Uh, Let's see here, 11 is the number. So five times younger than the most populous group in, uh, you know, basically in the, in the U.S. today. Because remember, this is the slide I was hoping y'all didn't see very well, but right here, 58 is that chart. Hispanics right here are at 11, so not quite as large, but emerging. And so it makes up about 20% of the population. So everything still holds true everything correlates. So what does that mean? We talked about this. Come on. Here we go. So when we go with the numbers, those are the numbers. So with the most populous demographic, you're talking about seven years of good consumer purchasing power. Theoretically, right? Uh, we work a lot longer than 65. But for corporate America, $441,000 left for a non-Hispanic white. If that's my target demographic, I'm missing out on potentially $2.9 million. And we're not even counting the years where they're still begging, you know, mommy and daddy, buy me the next Xbox, because we still got seven years to go. <laughs> so, so we're not really counting those in the equation. So tremendous purchasing power. Why aren't we starting to build a relationship with such a young consumer? Because Generation Z is emerging, if not already here. Millennials we know about. Average age, y'all nailed it. So the Gen Z, quick facts, 143 billion, both in direct and indirect spending pre-COVID. We're talking about 91% more likely to consume English speaking digital media. They're digital natives, so let's just be honest. If my, I can't get my kid off his iPad. And they place a high value on their ethnic background, community, and cultural roots. So remember I led with culture, not language. This is kind of a, kind of a precedence, precedence to say that the younger generations absolutely care about their culture, despite the 11%, but they still you know, go to their quinceaneras. They still attend the family Sunday dinners. They want their heritage to be recognized. So why do business struggle? Why? I mean, that's the pretty much point. Well, it's not our fault. It's not your fault. It's the existing business behavior's fault, because really, 75% of uh, today of businesses believe, again, Hispanic marketing is not really important. You know, doesn't care about the organization, the industry. I can get into deep numbers. I'm very specific, and you'll be shocked at some of the percentages. And we're going to get into some of that in a second. Or they fail to understand the cultural distinct behaviors 
or they don't have the, uh, they don't address the operational concerns. I was just giving a story about this, like I had a store in, uh, when I was working for Verizon back in the day, and they were wondering why sales were lacking in a, in a dense Hispanic community. It's like, because no one in your store speaks Spanish. <laughs> so, I mean, that's kind of a disconnect. So that's what I mean by uh, operational concerns. Or they subscribe to a one-size-fits-all national and local Hispanic strategy. <laughs> that means, what? Everybody speaks Spanish. I mean, it's a, what are you talking about? No, it, it, this is a big no for me. So we're going to unpack and demystify some of these pain points, these constraints that we were presenting. So let's talk about the first one. And this uh, is so common. It's, when we look at this, okay, so we've got the national breakdown there, right? Those are the numbers. But when you talk about ad spend, you know, obviously that's a 288, and that's true. I hadn't updated the slide, but this is still the percentages hold down. Bulk of the media is in general population, right? We just covered that 284 billion just last year alone. Roughly less than 5% are geared to what, because what corporate America and what SMBs really do is put it in niche marketing. It's all about Hispanic marketing. But why? That's my question, and that's my challenge is because we just uncovered. That 11% of the audience doesn't even speak Spanish or don't consider themselves Hispanic, but yet we want their cultural uh, heritage recognized. So does that necessarily translate to one, you know, a niche? What I'm proposing, again, is more of an integration. You know, and we're going to talk about how to integrate within your general marketing strategy and talk about what does that really mean? Because when you talk about integrated, okay, does that really make a lot of sense? Because niche, oftentimes that's the first thing that goes away. Sales aren't there, you know, we're not getting the ROI. That's one of the first things that the budgets cut. So most folks will say, well, do they really shop in my category or industry? I mean, is this a really a big thing? Heck yeah. When you look at this, these are numbers that are over indexing in these categories. When you talk about healthcare, 24% over indexed, apparel, auto, sporting goods, beauty, they go out to eat. We love to eat 10 times a month <laughs> or more compared to 26% more than non-Hispanics. So we're talking about these categories of industries. Oh, and by the way, let's put some numbers behind it. $47 billion last year alone given and generated in auto loans to Hispanic drivers. When you talk about auto dealerships, that's pretty dang good news. Oh, we spend $270 more on groceries. Remember that Bansa that we're trying to feed? We're trying to keep up there? Yeah. We love dogs, <laughs> actually more than any other uh, demographic, and we spend 2.7 times faster growth in dog food sales compared to the general population. And then we take more vacations, 72%. We'll take two plus more vacations this year compared to the 55% of non-Hispanics. So these are just a snapshot of all the various industries that are out there. You know, when I run campaigns, these are typically the numbers, 10x at least, over what I can consider general population. Here's who's not so great. When we talk about, you know, the sporting good industry, it's shocking to learn that 2% of the ad spend only target Hispanics. We're talking total spend here, 2% of their annual budget as an industry. When we look at, you know, bring that down to say, okay, what does that mean for like gym memberships as an example? Well, we spend $10 more for the average gym membership than the non-Hispanic. What does that mean in translate? More classes, more whatever. When you think about the industry as a whole, peripherals, apparel, you know, shoes, the whole nine, you know, this will also translate into greater growth because we just covered how we over-index in all those other categories. So it's a clear miss. In fact, less than $4 million ad dollars was invested in Spanish language ads compared to the $173 million in general ad spend. So when you talk about hunting, talking about fishing, talking about all the water activities out there, this is something that obviously we can improve on. And in fact, your e-com shops like Amazon is spending more money on Spanish language ads than some of your big bucks like your academies or dicks and the like. So you're thinking about competition, thinking about that desert versus the forest. I'm too big to fail. If you're not careful, you know, other folks are going to take that market share, take your wallet share, and own that because they're attacking a consumer that, again, is still very, very young. Another industry, you know, I think we all can agree that the Latinas represent 18.5% of the beauty revenue. You know, we're talking, you know, that covers makeup, hair care, 
the like. In fact, they spent $2 billion on makeup alone just last year. Yet, they only represent 6%, 6% in content across all platforms. Now, when I talk about content, I'm not just talking about the written word. You know, it's tone, imagery as well, right? So when you look at this, Latina beauty shoppers outspend their peers by nearly 30%. You know, I had a case study where I had a, a national beauty chain ask me, hey, why am I losing to the other guy? It's because you don't have any Latinas. These, and this is a New York study. I was like, you need to put more folks that represent your local community into your ads and talk about the products that they care about. And then you should see increased traffic into your stores, that foot traffic, right? So again, only 6% are represented in, you know, across the industry. Now let's talk about eating because I'm hungry. <laughs> They're getting it right. You know, QSR, you know, in fact, from a family style restaurant, at least once a week. And QSR has it right. Why? What did they identify early on? They put kid friendly menus out there. That's why you, you see these big QSR chains, McDonald's, you know, all, all the teams, right? I can, I can depend that my kid's hungry, I can go here. And they're spending five billion targeting both uh, Hispanic and black youth. So it's no surprise why they're doing so well. And in fact, they use relevant ad content targeting this demographic. And, you know, Hispanics are more inclined to opt for, again, family-oriented uh, places when dining out. Because we, we go with two or three generations. I'm bringing my abuelo, I'm bringing my kids, I got myself, I'll bring my cousins, cousins, sister, whatever, right? It is a big table, so the average check value for those tables Enormous, right, compared to, and again, we're not going to talk about frequency. Bottom line, super consumers, 1.7 trillion just last year alone. Isaac already mentioned seventh largest GDP in the world if we were our own country. So we got money. We want to spend this money, and we're asking ourselves, okay, so how are we going to attract it? Well, all I got to do is market in Spanish, right? That's the thing. That's the secret sauce. No. Well, I, I don't say no. I say depends. Um, because it depends on what your business objective is. Okay? Depends if I want to target a certain demographic in a certain region. For example, I'm targeting currently Puerto Rico. 90, 95, 95, 90 to 95% of the island speaks only Spanish. So I'm not going to go in with an English speaking ad campaign, right? So where it makes sense, I'm going to use Spanish. But. If you're creating content focused on language, just on language and not culture, then this is a tricky statement. Language, not culture. This could be the primary reason why you're not seeing the success that you think you should be because you're not driving the right engagement. And we're going to talk about this and impact what I mean by that. But please understand, Hispanics have been talking English for a long time and Spanish. You know, but it's only been recent that companies are starting to get that. <laughs> so. Let's go into it. So when I talk about content, brands are confused on what content marketing is, with Spanish content marketing. So when we talk about that, I already mentioned it. It's not just about the language, it's about the culture and the tone, uh, the imagery and the tone, excuse me. Culturation levels, as we already indicated, are higher now and are only going to continue to rise. So the affluence between Spanish and English, it's okay to start to use English. It's okay to start using Spanglish. And as long as it's done culturally, right? Culturally, uh, with great respect. We've been speaking Spanglish this whole time. We just probably not even realize it. As such, the Hispanic audience that may not speak Spanish, i.e. Gen Z, are they're still seeking the relevant content. In fact, Spanish content, not using English con target content. Okay, so let me unpack what I mean by this. So when I look at data, I'm a data geek, and we do all this general population research. I want to target the soccer mom. You know, this is what she looks like. This is who my target audience should be. When I go into a niche market, you know, that niche marketing strategy, which is very so common, we take all that great data and we tuck it out the window and we guess we gotta speak Spanish. That's the secret sauce. We don't take the valuable learnings from that data and apply them to the Spanish audience. Most, most companies, most corporate America, the conversations I have, I'm shocked by this. So target the Sarka mom as you would in general population, the same way you would in Spanish. Nothing changes. Demographics or the consistent spying patterns aren't going to change. 
So the decision to market only in Spanish, this shouldn't this necessarily, I'm not advocating it should disappear. Keep it the same, but be relevant in how your approach is. Ensure that the translation, more importantly, is in the proper context, respects the cultural cult, and the persona are adhered to. I'm going to speak to why I say dialect in a couple minutes. Avoid Hispanic stereotypes or cultural cliches, right? So don't assume we all eat the same bean, the pinto bean, and I like my black beans también, I like my tejano, and I like my salsa merengue. I mean, there's all sorts of things. So don't fall into this. This is, this, I'm in Texas, okay, he must like tejano. I mean, right? For example, that's top, you know, so you want to use your market research at the hyper local level as best, as granular as you can get. And don't assume that you have the power of one. Oh, I've got a, I've got a Hispanic on my team, so, <laughs> so I understand Hispanic audience. No. Yeah, so you may want to really focus on your focus groups, talk to other consumers, trying to get a more informed opinion with various research to really understand what you're trying to you know, achieve with your said business objective. We've already covered this. If you're not mobile, you know, you're already behind. Uh, you know, this is a digital native audience. Um, you know, we've talked about and discussed no more than six feet, man. This is arm length away. So everything that you should be doing is mobile, shareable. We over-index. I can't even tell you, um, you know, or I can. It's just, it would be a lot longer conversation on the importance of mobile. But here's what I mean by content. So I said, OK, I talked a lot about that. So here, beauty industry, obviously a Latina, all in Spanish. And it's wonderful. But if you notice the name, it's English. That's OK. Beauty Insurance Plus, got it. Está bien, right? I had a national furniture retailer says, I, Trinidad, I don't want to use Spanish. Great, but don't use just all beige furniture, those neutral tones that you like to put in the general population. <laughs> Make it look like it's the living room that we live in. Throw some colors, throw some throw pillows, do something, right? But make it look like, and we can envision it. I didn't use any Spanish, but I made the imagery relevant. Spanglish, rock your best look siempre. Okay, that's okay. It's powerful, I get it. Simple, it's one of the common words. Mas loud, kind of funny, I just thought it in there, you know. You get louder, okay, you know, but it's, uh, it's one of these cultural, uh, you know, it's one of these church and state kind of things that I want to debunk. It's like, it's not necessarily always in Spanish, folks. Spanglish is okay, we are more accepting of that as long as it's done tastefully. And of course, you can go all the English route. You know, definitely Hispanic by Lawan James. You know, what's relevant here is the bright colors and the chancla. You know, the little flipper that's being thrown because that's pretty much part of our culture. You know, at least that's how my mom raised me and I get in trouble. She'd throw the chunk and hit me in the back of the head to stun me. And so we all can relate to this. We also have some sort of cultural relevance to this. But the point is, when you put out ads, whatever uh, platform you do, make it relevant. Make your imagery. Make the content, the written word relevant to the uh, audience you're trying to reach. This one size fits all is a failed strategy. And why is it a failed strategy? For example, if you look at Texas and California, 84, 87% Mexican descent. Huge, right? But if I try to take that marketing ad campaign into Miami or into New York, where it's the complete inverse, 86%. You're talking about how I say supermarket, it's completely different. Little cultural distinct uh, nuances. So you want to look at your approach at the, as local as you can so that way you could be more relevant to the target audience you're trying to reach and engage and impact. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And then targeting audience, uh, targeting them, it's not necessarily always easy. I'm gonna target by the last name, you know? <laughs> but what if my spouse is Hispanic, but I'm not? Target by my nationality. Well, this is true for me. You know, I'm Mexican, but my mother's Panamanian, so are you gonna you know, appeal to which bean for me? You know, I'm a, uh, I'm targeting only by first generation, but I lived in America my whole life. We don't know. When we buy data from these big box companies, it's not, it's hard to tell unless you have, you know, a gross amount of indexing and it's a lot, it's quite the investment. Targeting only using Spanish, we talked about this, my favorite. Gotta use soccer. That's the, that's the win of hearts and minds. No, hombre. I mean, I'm not even a soccer guy. I, I love the World Cup, but that's about it. That's my extent of soccer, right? So who are the teams again? You know, baseball, NFL, you know, things or other, you know, traditional sports. Occupation. I'm in, not in construction. I actually have an MBA. 
So we can't, again, avoid those stereotypes, those cultural cliches. Don't just necessarily assume that the relevant message um, with the imagery is going to fall into one of these mini pitfalls. So again, I talked about an integrated strategy. And here's the advantage of it. Because what I talked about was really, OK, I still want to run my English speaking general population campaign. But if I change that furniture store image, is that going to really impact my English speaking customers? Probably not. If I use a little bit of Spanglish, my favorites Wells Fargo back in the day, about eight years ago, which they said it was a, you know, the, the, the scene was, you know, multi generational family in the house. The young lady just got her first paycheck. The only Spanish she said was, Hola familia, and the rest was in English. And they caught me because I was like, Holy guacamole, she spoke to me. She said two words. That's all it took. I'm still talking about it six, eight years later, right? So, oh, so having a refined strategy. Delivering relevant and authentic content, it's scalable. You know, you can start building your database and measuring, again, efficient targeting, higher engagement, and a greater ROI. This is what relevant Hispanic marketing looks like. Again, it's not asking to build a niche. It's just adding it as part of your general population spin. That's it. Minor tweaks to your overall current strategy. And if you heard nothing else, these are the four takeaways. Be as local as you can. Be as relevant as you can. Be authentic when you put out your message. And of course, be connected, be mobile. These are the four talking points if you've got nothing out of this presentation. OK? So we're not going to get into the, the details, but I am willing to entertain any questions that y'all have. Yeah. You know, as, as um, you know, as, as we look at the, the spend by, by certain categories, uh, you know, I, I think, um, let's say the 90s, you know, there was this big insurance spend. All the insurance companies were spending, you know, I, in particular, I was with my company, American Family. And, you know, all of a sudden, this thing dropped off the cliff. It just went, you know, so, our, our, so when we're, when we're looking at corporate America, are we looking at a consistency of these marketing departments, you know, that are led by these, you know, sometimes millennials, you know, is it their lack of understanding about the market? I mean, because where's the consistency? Uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us remember American Family Insurance here in this, in, in this metro area, a lot of visibility. It, they hired this new VP, and it all went away. All these years of work and of, of branding to these, uh, and I mean all the groups, Asian. But, so, so what is that challenge now as we look at corporate America now? Uh, the people aren't working at the building anymore. How do you... Right. How do you keep your marketing team together virtually? Some of those, some sure. of those questions. Yeah, absolutely. And I and actually um, really because I work with various local chambers, right, yeah. to help out SMBs because they're really the hat, you know, they wear so many hats. So I try to instill this in them to get in good practice to what the Fortune 500s do, right, because they can afford big marketing budgets. So I really focus more on performance-driven marketing strategy because it's about the bottom line. What's required, in my opinion, is what the mar modern marketer needs to do is really understand the data. You really have to go beyond the top line numbers. What did I spend? What, did I, what was my revenue? What was my ROI? Because what you're going to find is that when you dive in, and if you really can understand down to the local level, you're going to see pop pockets. Like, what did my social media campaign do? What did my print ad do? What did my whatever? Because that just 33% of the CMOs on the national scale kind of get that. That's the reason why we don't see a lot of investment in certain of these underserved segments, especially amongst Hispanics, right? We're talking about a lot of multicultural marketing right now. But what does that really mean? And how is that impacting that respective demographic? By looking in, going down a couple of layers, it's a little bit of an art and science, right? Uh, for example, you know, well, how I use data is I look at like the Google Analytics as one example, right? And you can look at, if you have it all set up with the pixels and all that, they show you down to the demographic level. I saw this. Our website that I, for a company I'm advising right now, you know, we generate about two, 300,000 visitors per month, right? And then I started saying, okay, where are they coming from? And then I start looking and I saw this little blip, 0.6%. It's like maybe 
10, 15,000 folks. I'm like, what the heck is that? Why, why it caught my eye was because they spent more time on my website. They were more engaged than any other person, average time on the website. And I'm like, who the heck is this? It was, and that's where Puerto Rico came in. And I'm like, the Puerto Ricans are coming in. I'm not even marketing to them. I'm doing this national general population kind of you know, social media, all that digital strategy. But that's what marketers need to do. That's what boardrooms need to do is get down to that level. And it says, if I apply a Spanish, Hispanic marketing strategy to Puerto Rico, what the heck can we actually do? Because I'm not even trying right now. And by putting in the operational infrastructure, working with my respective departments, being a liaison between, really, it's more about the relation. How do we start to build the relationship in Puerto Rico? Where, by the way, traditional marketing is probably extremely valuable in Puerto Rico versus the digital marketing because of how their society's set up, right? But it has to be in Spanish, and, that, and I have to use the Puerto Rican dialect, yeah. right? I cannot just use you know, my Texas dialect, and then I go, no, no, no gracias. So that, that's where you, know, you have to have, I guess, the modern marketer really needs to understand those cultural nuances. You know, I don't care, again, what industry you're in, what's your agenda. It's all about the business objective for me. And is my marketing strategy aligned with that said business objective? That's where I think that 33% can grow. You have to invest in the right data sets, the data suites, if I'm a, just a small mom and pop then you know, definitely try to do that as best as I can and really have that performance measuring so I can measure my ROI based on that. Sir? Uh, real, real quickly, I know that um, uh, Isaac said there was a rule of three called engage, engage, engage in yeah. your presentation. Mm -hmm. Your rule of three is measure, measure, measure. Because yeah. I think bottom line, if you're going to have a sustainable uh, multicultural initiative within your business, your, corp your corporation, you really have to engage, engage, engage the C-suite and measure, measure, measure your data so that, so that both elements are working together to mm -hmm. be for the long run. And may have, to answer Rick's question, what happened you know, to, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, to uh, what was the insurance yeah. company? American, American, American family. family. What happened? What happens, in, and that was with Allstate, is typically you have a sponsor mm. who, who convinces the C-suite to invest. And as long as he or she is there, the investment continues. But once that person is gone, unless you've integrated exactly. the work, unless you've integrated the work into the organization, once that person is gone, the work stops. And, yeah, and, and absolutely. And that's where that integrated marketing strategy is probably not a popular idea, right? It requires a change of thought philosophy at the corporate CC level. You know, when you talk about national campaigns, you talk about you know, down, you know, because what's the number one thing that any owner is going to ask? What's my ROI? That CMO, that VP of marketing, has to address to the board yeah. to say, I invested this much money. This is how much revenue I generated. And then they, and then there's always the infamous chopping block. Well, you got to do it with 10% less. And so by having a niche marketing program, there's my 10%. I'm good to go for my general population, and that's how I'm going to still meet the KPIs, whatever that may look like. Uh, I've noticed too is the um, the birth rate in Latinos is uh, higher than the um, traditional white Caucasian. Do you have numbers about what that is? Because I think that bodes well to the future if that continues to be a higher birth rate within the Latino community. Um, what I can say is it has slowed down over the last decade. It's still like the fastest emerging demographic, to my knowledge, is the Asian demographic in terms of. Uh, population growth but in like I'll use Dallas Texas because that's just the numbers that came up that's why I was researching for a lot of this but it's here I'm trying to find it the birth well I can say that in Dallas Texas that we led by we being Hispanic populations were the population driver because non-Hispanic uh, whites were definitely downtrend versus the Hispanic population birth rates were up what's that exact ratio I don't have it top of mind but I think that's um, consistent. In fact, I, I couldn't echo that. that. That was beautifully said because uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure if I put it in this deck. But the, the point is, yeah, 64% consider himself American and Hispanic. It's that blending that you're talking about, right? It's the blending where, but I can't recall if it was Isaac or uh, I think you had mentioned it, that it's really they want to be relevant. They want to be represented in the ad copy. 
And that's why I specify culture and not language. Because when you say that you know, only 6% of the beauty industry you know, is, has Latina representation, it costs you nothing to put a Latina art, you know, a person on the ad. Everything else could be the same, right? Or that furniture, yeah, could be the same sofa, just throw some you know, uh, yeah, bright yellows, orange, whatever it is, right? That's the point. It's, we're not asking corporate America or how I advise and consult, it's like, I'm not telling you to do anything different, but can you make that cultural connection, that relevant connection to, the, to this potential audience? Because in this geo, you know, as an example, if you're in Texas, it's like, yeah, it's the new majority, you know, by all rights. So if I go into Dallas, you're really missing the mark. If I'm here in Minnesota and I want to target this area, then I better be as relevant as I can so I can drive up sales you know, in this value. So that's what I'm trying to say is relevancy matters um, and, you know, and it doesn't have to be invasive. It doesn't have to be Spanish, unless that's your point. Right, and what we're thinking about is in terms of demographics. The demographics used to be you know, the, the, uh, the background, the, uh, you know, your, your, your trade says whatever culture you're from. I think the lead demographics now is age. Mm -hmm. We're thinking more in terms of age because the age is now really pushing Correct. the marketing plans. Yep. And those generations, they really and they're becoming the new consumers as you pointed out earlier. And we're paying a lot of attention to the age of our targets way more than we are maybe the cultural side. Even though that's important because they're all members of families that have, you know, old guys like me, you know, old yeah. boomers. And so we're still relevant, but not as relevant as the age. Correct. Well, I mean, in a common Spanish household, it's about, I want to say, uh, these numbers vary, but I want to say 75 to 80% still speak Spanish at the home, right? So, they probably have a huge age, uh, gap. It, it, it's a multi-generational household, as, as it, you know, just especially here in the, in the Minnesota area, right? We talked about, you know, the abuela and the you know, family, the kids. So you really have to still not necessarily exclude Spanish, but, you know, that's why the use of Spanglish put a fun spin. But as, again, it's being relevant. And that's how I can't stress that enough because you know that's what Hispanic culture is really looking for. 80, 90 percent prefer brands that are relevant to their culture, and then they'll reward you in space by being more brand loyal, more of this, that, or another. Well, one, one, last one last one. One last one. Ta especially talking about the relevancy and and the age and, and and things like that. When I do the when I talk about digital marketing, it's so important that as much as the information that you're messaging, that you're putting out there, you have to realize that even though they may not have picked up your phone call or read your email or anything like that, that end user is looking at you. And with the social media, your profiles can be just as important as your website, mm -hmm. right? Who you do business with, who, what church you go to, whether you like football or football, right? Mm -hmm. Things like that. How is that? How important is that, or is there a strategy in that when you're targeting the Latino community for them when they look back at you, what are they looking for? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the Gen Z is more likely going to be more in that CSR initiative, that corporate social responsibility, and really look at about what does that company stand for? Are you, you know, I want to, do you stand for humanity? Do you stand for this? Whatever the, that issue is, the environment, all the things, right? So how important is that? That to me, personally, uh, I don't have a really great professional opinion on what does my company stand for. It's more about what are the products and services I'm trying to um, reach to this respective audience, right? That, you know, is for me personally, from a Gen Z perspective, and I need, you know, transparency, more research on how important is that. It's, it's a percentage, yes. It's, is it 20? Is it 50? There's, there's data sets that we can come back and find out for, but I don't understand. Uh, but that, I don't have any concrete data points to really uh, rec recollect on. Well, how about I, oh, go ahead, Ray. If I, if I can add, it's a really great question. Uh, when, we're, when at Allstate, I would say, we would ask, what, what does the Hispanic see when it stands in front of the Allstate people? What's the reflection? Mm -hmm. We had it backwards, because we eventually turned around. When Allstate stands in front of the Hispanic people, what does it see? It sees a reflection of the values we have in yeah. common. Yes. So what is Allstate's values as a brand have in common with the Hispanic market? That's what you want to target on, because that makes you culturally relevant. That's right. Yeah. Well said. Wow. How about a hand for a good Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.